You're listening to a conversation from season one between Joanna Rakoff, author and Swifty, and Tamara Federici, producer of every band ever. Tamara is currently helping Taylor design more bodysuits for her tour and was unable to record this week's episode. We'll be back soon, you sexy animals. You're listening to a conversation between Joanna Rakoff, author and Swifty, and Tamara Federici, producer of every band ever, already in progress. At a certain point, I found myself in my kitchen and the kids and my husband um, were listening to 1989 in our living room. And I did not realize what was happening, but I sort of, it was almost as if I were in a kind of fugue state. I was supposed to be cooking dinner, but instead I was dancing alone to shake it off. <laughs> and that was when I realized that something profound had happened. And I was a, I was a different person than I had been before. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just kind of gave in at that point. Um, you had a reckoning. Yes, I still didn't call myself to Swifty at that point, oh, but wow. um, but I, you know, and for there was a period where I um, thought that 1989 was a genius album, um, and but I wasn't in love with her earlier stuff. But then my son um, became pretty um, excited about Red, and I grew to think that was an even better album and now i'm just full on swifty wow so what was the was it because it was when your son was into it that pushed you over the edge from 1989 from that experience (laughs) from the experience you had in 1989 to that that time yeah i think i just actually heard the songs on 1989 so often that i was able to kind of hear them as songs without the kind of noise about pop music surrounding it, you know, without kind of this idea of what kind of music I listen to or who I, who I am, who I should be. Um, I heard them as songs and it's like, these are great. And I will say that this might fall into the category of noise, but one of the things that my kids kept telling me was, you know, she writes all her own music and, (laughs) um, and eventually after they told me that about 400 times, I um, I started listening to lyrics and um, realized that she is, you know, kind of a genius. And um, I was fascinated by the way she reinvents herself on every album. Um, and yeah, so I would say, you know, it was 1989 that pushed me over the edge into being a full on Taylor Swift fan. So, I mean, I'm obviously so excited to talk to you about this. I was so shocked when I when I asked you what you wanted to talk about, and you were like Taylor Swift. I did not see that coming. I know. Not, not I know. Well, I told my husband that you had asked me to uh, talk with you, and um, he was like, "Oh, so." Um, and I said, "I'm I'm having trouble deciding what to do because, as you know, I'm a huge music person. You, know, I was a yeah. DJ in college." You, you know, too. at Overland Radio sta- Station. Yeah, I'm yeah, just like oh, wow. my whole youth going to shows in New York, and um, you know, and he said, um, "Bob Mold, Elvis Costello." <laughs> and I was like, "I want to talk about Taylor Swift," and he actually was like, "Oh, that's a great idea." <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you were talking about. Um, you know, looking at the lyrics of a Taylor Swift um, song, do you happen to remember any of your favorite or any of that that kind of speak to you? Yes, I have so many favorites that it's it's hard to decide. Um, but some of my favorites are um, The Last Great American Dynasty, a pretty recent one. Um, I, of course, love the song Love Story. Um, which I have basically memorized, obviously a very an early and sort of sentimental song. Um, and it's a song that my family during the pandemic would have sing-alongs to, and we still do. Um, I have three kids now, and sometimes we'll be driving places and we'll have a love story sing-along. Um, I love um, Gold Rush. I love um, Clean from 1989. Um, I love so many. It's hard to decide on a favorite. Um, I love uh, my, and my first favorite song was actually Blank Space from 1989. Okay. That was the song. That's really the song that pushed me over. Um, now I love every song on that album. So, <laughs> do you have a favorite Taylor Swift song? 
I mean, I'm going to say, the, the, you know, it's all in the latest album. I'm going to say all the latest songs are the, my favorite album. I mean, uh, you know, my favorite songs because, you know, I can't go, I can't go backwards. I just have to go forwards with her, you know? Right. So that's a good um, life motto. Yeah. I mean, I just saw, I was not involved in the video for uh, all too well, but that was, you know, I was glad to see the 10 minute version come back out instead of the shorter version. So that was pretty great. But, um, and I also like the video for, uh, for the new album also, but I feel like I have to, I have to say those, those are the babies now, you know, so that sounds um, you creepy. Mean, the album, <laughs> you mean Midnight's, the really new album. Midnight's, the really new album, right. So I would say ah. anything, you know, all of those off of those, you know, but let's talk about Blank Space then, if you want. Um, what specifically did you like in Blank Space? I mean... The line that um, for a while was like my Twitter bio. <laughs> um, Darling, I'm a nightmare dressed like a daydream. Um, and I, there is something for me really freeing about that song. Um, this is all going to sound a little bit cliched, but I think it is not just the lyrics, but sort of the whole composition of the song um, that kind of... Um, subversive like for me it felt subversive in a kind of personal way i suppose it is subversive in a political way but um there's a way in which um it reminds me of um the sylvia plath poem lady lazarus where she says you know i rise with my red hair and i eat men like air which was very subversive for its time you know in 1963 when it came out um and it i feel like it has blank space does a similar thing um it you know she's kind of it, there's an irony to it and she's kind of saying you know i'm the one in charge here like you kind of think that you're in charge and you're gonna chew me up and spit me out but actually i'm in charge and in fact um these sort of terrible things that you're thinking about me um you know i'm excited about my destructive power <laughs> um and i guess you know i don't know if you feel this way too tamara like you're a very powerful person um in a way that i'm not you know a person who's kind of like like tells people what to do you know whereas like i just kind of sit by myself and do stuff um aside from when i worked on a film but um but for me um i think i've always been a very rule following person and i think my persona has very much been kind of like i'm good i'm kind i'm sweet and um that song um you know felt very cathartic to me um because it made me feel like okay taylor swift also had that persona of being like i'm good i'm kind i'm sweet and people see her as reinventing herself actually with um the album reputation um you know and um it, like in a kind of like miley cyrus chopping off all her hair and you know like, <laughs> her tongue or whatever sort of way um but i actually think that she was kind of doing this all along that she was saying like I'm not this kind of like sweet Southern girl, you know, I'm not actually, you know, Juliet, like in love story. Like I'm um, like, I rise with my red hair and I eat men like air, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm a nightmare dressed like a daydream. Like I'm a black widow spider, but I'm psyched about that. Like I'm not embarrassed about it and I'm not ashamed I'm psyched about it. And I think she's also saying this is just one component of, of who I am. You know, um, she's not saying like, I'm, it's not a kind of, a lot of her songs are um, to use like the lexicon of um, poetry, you know, are persona songs where she's taking on a, a persona and kind of writing in the voice of that person or their narrative, you know, their story songs, which is a little bit actually what, um, makes her different than a lot of contemporary artists, right? Like that's not the norm. Most people are not writing narrative songs, especially not like blockbuster or pop stars. Her songs are really different in terms of what they're doing. Um, the lyrically, like the way they rise and fall, um, they have a narrative arc to them usually, but in, so blank space is obviously a persona poem, um, in which she's kind of taking on this this persona of this kind of like man-eating woman who kind of has the veneer of a sweet girl um 
but I think it was her way of saying, you know, fuck you. Like I can be a bunch of different things at once. And like you, whoever, like Jake Gyllenhaal or whatever, like you're totally unimportant. Like you just filled a blank space for me. Like you're nothing. I love that. <laughs> so, I've, I've already moved on. Right. Yeah. That exactly. was yeah, I think that's been super important to her, but I totally had never seen, uh, yeah, you, the, your dual trajectory of um, being a good person and a, you know, and a nice person and her definitely being, you know, family oriented or, you know, listening to her parents and then kind of moving out of that space. Um, yes. You know, I was thinking when you were like, I'm nice, I'm good. But that's, that didn't, you're, you're right. That never came up for me <laughs> as a person. <laughs> <laughs> it's so easy. And that's one of the reasons that I love you. <laughs> this is mine is what's happening? Where are we? Let's do it. <laughs> that's it. Those are my three. I don't yeah, but I but somebody like her, she is um you know, I feel like she played into um, you know, some male fantasy some male fantasies in the beginning that have been sort of subverted since and um you know, uh, the, when you're saying, when you're talking about the persona, um, you know, the scenarios that she creates, I feel like she's been doing that since, since the very first album and that love story, especially that you were talking about is, you know, definitely like that. I mean, I think it's funny. It's who, you know, who thinks about rewriting Shakespeare, you know? I mean, I always like the idea that at a tragedy that you get a puppy at the end of the play. And I've always wanted to rewrite <laughs> a play that you, you know, after somebody's like eyes have been gouged out, that indeed you could, you know, you're like, well, you, you know what, this is a real shit show. But also, here's a puppy. You know what? Thank you for playing. <laughs> you know, thanks for the game of life. So I don't write, you know, I, I'm definitely like steering her in that vein of like, let's make everything turn out okay. Because um, in the beginning, that's what I liked too, was was sort of like, we've all been through so much tragedy. Uh, you know, here's a puppy. Um, there's a puppy. There's a happy ending. Yeah. I mean, because I guess even the kind of darker songs, um, there is, like, melodically, there is a sort of upbeat feel to them, in a way. Yeah, I, I mean, like, I mean, except for stuff like, you know, Bad Blood is different, but that's like, um, you know, I she's, I can't imagine having this many fans uh, scrutinizing you this way, but... Um, you know, I, I'm sure that's you have a lot of rage pent up from just dealing with everyday life. Um, so I feel yeah. like bad bloods or these vigilante shits and things like that. That's that's par for the course. Um, but we, I wanted to go back to um, you're talking about the post persona, uh, <laughs> the persona songs, and I'm sure as a Swifty, you already know this um, about the glitter pin songs and the you know, the quill, uh, the, the quill pin songs and things like that. Do you know this already? No. Oh, okay. So she has, she says that her, um, you know, when we started together, she said she had three different kinds of pens that she uses to write songs with. So these are sort of the persona ones. Right. So one is a quill pen, one is a fountain pen, and one is a glitter gel pen. Oh. Right? <laughs> so... Uh, and everything kind of falls in one of these categories, right? But um, there are also so many more pins than that. And I don't think, I don't think her fans know this. I don't think she tells anybody. I also think she loses pins. But <laughs> there's, there's some pins that are tiny pins. There's teeny pins. There's mood pins, moog pins, and moon pins. So there's like at least wow. 12 other pins that she hasn't even gotten into yet. Um and I don't know, you know, I I haven't seen anything like that on Twitter, but you know, wait, I'm so just curious. Free. Yeah, so those like, are so all. She, um, is she into like the kind of like scented gel pens, you know, that are hugely popular in Japan, like the kawaii pens, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, the like that could cute be a glitter pen. Yeah, yeah. I was um, wondering. I, I actually love those. <laughs> good. I love. Just the I mean, they're kind of irresistible. <laughs> I agree. So uh, the quill pen is for um, things that are mostly about Colonial Williamsburg from what she's told me. But um, yeah, and then there's a Sharpie. I'm sorry, I almost forgot. There's a Sharpie pen and that's for songs about work, songs about getting fired, anything where you need to write your name on a box and you need to get out of town. 
So that's right. pretty much, that's a lot. Anything involving the word deadline. <laughs> yeah, those don't usually make the final cut. It's usually like boys and situations and heartbreak and emotions. So, um, you know, put it in the box. Anything that's put it in the box is that's, you know, unless it's that Beyonce song, it usually gets cut before you hear it. Um, I'm curious what, I mean, I'm you know, almost scared to ask this, but like, what is it like working with her? She is pretty is that cut and dry. <laughs> no, um, she's pretty much the same throughout. She, she kind of knows what she wants. She likes to, um, she gets up really late. When you work with her, you actually have to go to her compound, um, mm-hmm. which is, you know, in Nashville and at the lakes and, um, actually sleep in a cot next to next to her room because she's got a piano in her room and other things and I just um when she wakes up in the middle of the night you just sort of hear some you know like some some tinkling or some strumming or something like that and you just kind of know you need to get up and then um you start just recording and then you get Jackie Antonoff and we call him Jackie Sparkles <laughs> Jackie Sparkles oh my god really yeah and the <laughs> Jackie Sparkles in the quiet one. That's the, the Aaron Dessner is the quiet one. That makes sense. And yeah. And you get them on a conference call. And then, you know, from there, she kind of just, she works it out. And then you get a rhyming dictionary and then you see if that's good. And then you throw it out and she, uh, you know, she will tell you from a woman's point of view, what she is trying to say. And then sometimes she'll yeah. flip it. Yeah. And tell you from a man's point of view. And then you figure out the difference. And, you know, with, with this kind of reinvention with every album that is conscious, right? It's not just like that. She's thinking like, Oh, I'm kind of more interested in doing something that has more synth or distortion or like, she's consciously trying to kind of have a kind of concept album that's different than the previous one. Yeah. I I think she knows she's hunting for something. It might be like when you're looking for, you know, I don't know, you tell me when you're looking for uh, like a new book to write, you're just sort of kind of casting your net and you're sort of seeing what you're interested in. And I Mm -hmm. think um, for her, you know, it, it runs the gamut. Uh, You know, for a while I thought we were going to make an album based on a slip and slide and I wasn't sure how that was going to work. But I trust her. It was going to be a summertime album after sort of like the wintry, um, you know, uh, uh, pandemic albums. And um, it was going to be sort of a fun in the sun. And then I think she realized that we're not out of the pandemic yet. So we can't. Right. um, It's not time. It's not quite fun in the sun yet. We're sort of like fun in the pandemic. And that That seems typically astute of her like she's so kind of tapped in to where people are that she's like yeah. no we're not ready for a slip and slide nostalgia album that seems pre-pandemic you know yeah. that seems like the old us definitely old. Yeah. yeah uh for a while it was going to be about zoos we kept we went to zoos for about a year and uh every, every track was going to be the name of a different animal that was in love or in heartbreak. And then that didn't, yeah. I mean, koalas, this was about a koala with this complex relationship who had left another koala uh, and was currently eyeballing another koala, uh, but they weren't sure if it was going to work out. And the koala really needed to get out of that town. And I don't, we just never finished that one. Yeah. That seems like it would be a really interesting departure for her. It almost has like a Dada-esque aspect to it. <laughs> yeah, right. But I can see her going in that direction, being like, I'm going to make an art album that also has this kind of childlike naivete to it. That makes total sense. I love that. And is it hard to not just like hug her? Or is she not as sweet? Or not sweet, that's the wrong term. But she just seems she's so easy to love. <laughs> <laughs> she's just so lost in songs. She's so uh, eager to get out songs. Like I think she, <laughs> I think she's like the Stephen King of songwriting. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yes! I think she like goes to bed and then she wakes up and she's like, like it's sort of, you know. And then she'll, it's just sort of like if you let her rest, she'll reset 
and start up again with a new, you know, concept album. For updates, go to Every Band Ever on Instagram. Joanna Rakoff is the author of the international best-selling memoir My Sailing a Year and the best-selling novel A Fortunate Age. The film adaptation of the memoir opened in theaters worldwide in 2021 starring Margaret Qualley and Sigourney Weaver. Her new memoir, The Fifth Passenger, is forthcoming from Little Brown in 2024. Tamara Federici has scheduled a chaotic surprise. The editor is Will Velasquez. The audio engineer is Clark Jackson. Thanks for listening. See you next week.